So thanks for tuning in, everyone. My name's Louis Freeland Haynes, and I'm a graduate student at the Kitsis Lab at the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm going to be talking to you today about a fully automated method for acoustic identification and localization of terrestrial wildlife. So I'm going to outline the method, the hardware and the software that we use. Um, I'll show you that it works based on a speaker test where we deployed loudspeakers at known locations um, and played bird sounds. And then I'll show you some results uh, on a field deployment and compare it to conventional spot mapping surveys. So we also had surveyors out at this site and we'll see what the two methods look like. But first of all, why is it we care about being able to use acoustic localization? Well, it's a non-invasive monitoring method that can provide us with rich biological information, allowing us to investigate ecological and behavioral questions like habitat use and territory boundaries. And importantly, it unlocks methods for abundance estimation, which is otherwise something that's challenging to do from acoustics. To make sure that we're all on the same page about what I'm talking about, I'm going to quickly step you through how a grid of autonomous recording units can localize sounds using multi alliteration So if we have a bird singing somewhere in the middle of these four ARUs, the song will reach the closest one first at, let's say, time T0. We'll then reach the next furthest microphone at time T1, the next a little later at time T2, and finally the furthest microphone at time T3. So we have a set of four arrival times for the sound, one for each microphone. And each time difference of arrival, i.e. that difference in time between the sound arriving at the first mic and the next, defines a hyperbola along which the sound source could be located. So we can plot each of those hyperbola and where they intersect or the point closest to all of them is the most likely location of the sound source. So that's how it works in principle, but as always, the devil is in the details. So I'm going to talk you through how our pipeline actually works. And I'll start by briefly talking through the hardware. So we use AudioMoths, these cheaply available autonomous recording units, to deploy large microphone arrays like the one on the right. But the problem with autonomous recording units is that their internal clocks drift. And to localize sound based on times of arrival at different receivers, we need sub millisecond synchronization across all of the ARUs in the array. So we use audio moths with a GPS receiver added on. The timestamps of the GPS signals allow us to synchronize the start and end of recording periods across devices and also to correct for drift or differences in sampling rates during the recording period, as we use every GPS timestamp received to resample the audio to match the expected sample rate. So I very briefly outlined the hardware, and now I'm gonna talk about the meat of this, which is the software, and how we get from synchronized audio to localized positions. Now, localization arrays are not a new thing, and they've been widely used. But to try and scale beyond using hand annotated audio, where an expert listens and boxes sounds of interest, we automated the entire process. And I'm going to pick up talking about how the software works from after that audio synchronization I mentioned. So if you have synchronized audio from, say, multiple microphones recording through a single controller, rather than the audio GPS, audio moth GPS I mentioned, you'll also be able to use everything I'm showing you. And I'd like to point out that everything here is implemented in our open source Python package called Open Soundscape. So the first step is to detect and classify sounds of interest in the audio from all of your microphones. Uh, I'm going to whisk through this part a little because there's not enough time to explain convolutional neural nets, but that's the automated detection method that we're using. Essentially, there are machine learning methods that with enough examples can be trained to identify patterns, in this case, birdsong in a spectrogram. 
So in the actual experiments I'm going to show you, we trained multi-species CNNs to identify our species of interest in four second long spectrograms. Like here, where it's correctly identified the song of a common yellow throat in the spectrogram, giving a score close to one for that class. And if you want to train your own CNN to recognize sounds of interest to you, it's pretty straightforward to do so using Open Soundscape. Once you've got some examples of your sound from audio that you've listened to and annotated in software like Raven, you can load in that audio, pick the classes that you want to be able to identify, split the data into a training and validation set, and then the actual machine learning aspect of this takes place in these last two lines of code. So if you want to train a CNN on your own, it should be straightforward to do it in Open Soundscape. And if it's not, please let us know so that we can make it more straightforward. So you've seen that we're using convolutional neural nets for the automated detection part, and you can train one of your own. And I'm going to talk you through the localization aspect. So the first parts of this are to do with how we group the detections that we've generated and then estimate time delays between those microphones. So the first step, we need to somehow group audio clips that we believe contain recordings of the same sound event in the real world. One song of a bird, for instance. So for a given four second window that our CNN outputs detections on, we might have nine receivers where the sound has been detected, these red bubbles on our array. What we're going to do is pick one of them. And don't worry about which one, because after we do this, we're going to repeat it for each receiver with a detection. We're going to find other receivers within 150 meters of that. And this distance is something that you can adjust to the sound of interest and acoustic setting. It's the maximum distance apart that you think it's likely to be the same sound being heard. Then we estimate the time delays between the central receiver and other receivers in that circle with a detection. To estimate the time delays between two receivers, we use generalized cross-correlation. This basically lines up the signals, trying all possible different delays and where cross-correlation is maximized is likely to be the true delay between the two signals. You can see a perfect toy example here with two sine waves. But because our signals are actually very noisy with lots of other sounds in them, we do a few things to improve the accuracy of time delay estimation. We band pass the audio to species-specific frequency ranges. We apply a spectral weighting that's been shown to work well in this particular system. That's the FAT phase transform. And finally, we can also reject time delays where there's low signal coherence between the two receivers, where it might not be lining up the sounds that we're interested in, which we expect to be a major part of the signal. So we've now got a set of time differences of arrival. The time difference between it arriving at that central reference receiver and all of the other receivers within that circle. And we can use a localization algorithm to estimate the position from those time differences of arrival. We use the Bancroft GPS method. And importantly, we sometimes get estimated positions that look wacky. So we can choose to discard locations that only poorly match the time delays. In other words, if the bird actually sang from the position that we've estimated, when should the sound have arrived at each of the receivers? And how different is that from our observed data? So we can reject high error localizations based on the root mean square residual of those time delays. So to recap, we estimate a position using just one receiver as the central reference receiver. And within a time window, We'll do this again and again for every receiver with the detection, throwing away any that have low signal coherence or high residual error in the localized position. So here's another estimated position using a different reference receiver. 
Here's another. We try this one and we don't get one, perhaps because the time residuals are too high or there's low coherence between the signals. And we get another one. And then finally, another one. And here are our estimated positions within one single time window of this sound event. And if you or I were looking at that, we'd probably say that cluster of dots is the real position. And those two other dots are outliers that somehow slip through our error filtering. So we need an algorithm that does exactly what we've just done and can use the consensus of multiple points piled up in one spot. And dbscan is a density-based clustering algorithm that does exactly that. It can identify clusters of high density and remove the outliers. And it works with multiple clusters. So if you imagine we had another bunch of dots piled up somewhere else in the array, it would also be able to identify that. So to see in practice what dbscan does, we have a whole set of these predicted positions based off of one time window. And it will help us filter out the ones that we have low confidence in, and we get the mean positions of the dense clusters. So I'm going to show you the actual results now. And first, I'm going to show you the loudspeaker test. So we set up this array with microphones 50 meters apart and had eight loudspeakers within the array. These were playing bird vocalizations, and sometimes they were simultaneous, so they were overlapping. And in this plot, we have the positions of the loudspeakers marked with an X, a circle of radius five meters around them drawn, and the positions of the receivers, those red triangles. So we were able to estimate the positions of the loudspeakers with pretty high accuracy. And I really want to point out that a big part of this was that DB scan clustering. If you look at this before we've clustered those multiple positions, we often get erroneous estimates creeping through. Um, something else I should point out is that we got 54% of time windows localized, but this will really depend on the quality of your classifier. It could be a lot lower. So I'm also going to show you this field test where we deployed an array, and we also had people walking up and down the array doing spot mapping surveys, noting where they saw birds singing. And there's an easy case that we wanted to test it on first, which is the case of one common yellow throat that was always in the same position in the array every time. And the human observers spotted it here. And fortunately, our localization pipeline seems to be returning roughly correct positions because it also found it in the same part of the array every single time. I also want to show you a much harder case which is the case of oven birds, which are perhaps the most abundant bird at our study site. And if you look at these spot mapping surveys, you can see how dense it is and how difficult it is to use this method to map territories. So the dash red lines are different birds. The solid lines indicate multiple sightings of the same bird. And really, it's just so dense, it's almost impossible to pick any information out of this. And here is the result from our automated localization pipeline. Um, I'm not going to say that one is right or one is wrong, but it seems like this might be perhaps a better way of estimating territories of very abundant birds if it's such a struggle to get information out of the spot mapping. Uh, and finally, I know I'm running over, so I just wanted to leave you with a fun little GIF because it's always about the GIFs, which is demonstrating, I hope, the kinds of rich information that we can get out of a localization array like this. So we're looking at scarlet tanagers singing within our array. And you can see we get these multiple dots in the same place in consecutive time windows. You can maybe see some counter singing going on. Um, and it's really interesting to see if we can use this information towards estimating abundance and mapping territories. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody who took part in this project, uh, particularly everyone in the Kitsis lab, uh, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Lewis.
So now we'll, we'll open up about five minutes for any questions, starting with one in the chat. And looks like a clarification question about um, the CNN towards the beginning of this chain. Um, can we use AI to filter out, um, basically filter for specific species of interest um, ignore, and in doing so, ignore the background noise and other sound sources? Uh, yeah, that's, that's actually something that we intend to do. So there are some uh, sound source separation methods Method. um, that basically are able to try and disentangle multiple simultaneous sounds and extract them separately into separate channels. And that's something that we intend to do. Um, we were actually really surprised that it works quite well even without that. Um, just doing that filtering to the species specific frequency ranges and the phase transform, we seem to be able to estimate the time delays accurately. Um, but yeah, we want to use a sound source separation method um, and see how that affects it. Excellent. Let's go to Vijay. That was a that was a great talk. Uh, I had a question about uh, the distance that might be needed for you to, you know, accurately localize where the sound is coming from. Uh, because I'm wondering, do you need like a really concentrated set array of recorders for you to accurately map where the source is, or can that distance be beyond 150 meters? And you know, what's that threshold? Yeah. So um, if you are trying to estimate it um, within reasonable precision, it's going to benefit from having multiple densely spaced receivers. Um, but there's no reason why, if you have a sound that travels further, you couldn't use a more widely spaced array. Um, so if you are, for example, trying to localize a wolf howl or something like that that might be detectable over kilometers, you could use a similarly spaced array. Um, so there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to space them further apart if you can detect your sound of interest further apart. Luis, why don't we take a question from Tiago Marquez, who's done a lot of density-based work uh, in this field. So his question um, has to do with abundance. Can you assume that you detect all the cues produced um, like in your last array with um, in the, the GIF video that you showed, or are cues produced potentially missed? No, no, we're definitely missing some because every step along that pipeline, um, there's the potential that we're missing some. So at the front end, the convolutional neural network will have some recall that we can estimate. And we know that we're going to be missing the quieter calls, we might just have other loud sounds in the audio that obscure it. Um, and then similarly, all the way down the pipeline, we're likely to be getting some time delays wrong. Let's say there's another loud sound and we end up lining that up. And so we might end up with a dodgy location estimate that we have to throw out. So we know we're definitely losing cues along the way. Um, something that we're really interested in is seeing if we can find a reliable way to quantify that and actually be able to model how we're losing things and at what point. Wow, we were getting a lot of excellent questions. This one was upvoted from Tom. Tom, would you like to ask your question? Hello. Uh, thanks. Sorry, a wee bit, um, perhaps a ill-phrased question, but basically I, I quite often you see species which move a lot whilst they're singing, you know, and even just over very short distances. And I was thinking how that presumably represents quite a challenge for localizing um, individuals. So does it, would it just get dropped out during your pipeline or is it possible to track it over much shorter distances? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, if you've got something that's, say, doing song flight and moving a lot during that song flight, um, my guess would be that if you're using a longer time window, you're just not going to be able to localize it because it 
it, you'll end up with a bunch of contradictory time delays. Um, perhaps they'd come out of the mean position, I don't know, but I would, I would suspect that it wouldn't work. But probably if you were able to train a classifier that could work on much shorter audio lengths, so the kind of length of audio where you wouldn't expect the bird to have moved very far, even if it is in song flight, I would expect that that would work. And you'd end up with a bunch of predicted positions that would hopefully help you to actually track that song flight. Okay, I think um, we only have time for one more question because we've got two really interesting talks coming next. So um, what I'm hoping is... Um, Lewis, would you be able to, um, we have a good number of questions in the chat. Maybe we can tackle those, um, over the rest of this bioacoustics and to close us out, um, Baruj, I was wondering if you wanted to share your question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ben. Um, so I was just, uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, but I think you are using CNN on, uh, detecting species. So I was wondering how um, it fares when you have different individuals from the same species. Um, so how, how does your algorithm work then? Yeah, so when you've got multiple individual vocalizing of the same species, you might end up with something like this, but with a bunch of red dots all over the place. So detections of the species, we can't tell that they're different individuals at that point. We're only using it to classify to species a bunch of red dots across the array where it's detected in multiple places. Um, however, the idea behind this, picking a central receiver, estimating a position, picking another one, estimating a position, is that this will hopefully allow us to estimate the positions of multiple birds that are singing at the same time. Um, but you're right, the, the classification at, at the front end is just doing it to species. Okay, since that was a quick answer, I want to give Mike some uh, Mike the floor. Um... Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed the talk, and I, I I love the clustering method that you used as a, a way of dealing with uh, errors in the method. Um, I've had uh, um, I've spent some time trying to analyze errors in the uh, time you know the uh, time of uh, sound samples and recordings as a impediment to doing source location. And we found that in addition to clock drift, the drop uh, clusters of samples is a pretty significant source of error when attempting to do source location because of the need for very pr precise uh, sample times. Did you see any evidence of this? Um, when, sorry, just say that again. You said something about clusters yeah. of samples. Yeah, so in the recorders, you know, they, they put a you know, they're, they're um, recording into a buffer, you know, when they're um, sampling the sound. And then periodically, every second or, you know, depending on the recorder, it's roughly half second, second or whatever, those are being written to some media. And occasionally, that appears to be skipped, you know, as things get backed up mm -hmm. or whatever, and the buffer contents are not written to media. So, you know, um, yeah, we, with, with, we with that error going on, adjusting the beginning and the end of the recording to a uh -huh. line time doesn't uh, account for that. Yeah, we so we had exactly the same issue of samples being dropped mysteriously. Presumably, there's something like a buffer overflow going on. Um, we actually think in the latest firmware of this, it's been fixed. Um, but what we did to avoid that is every GPS timestamp that's received during the recording. So not just for the start and end, every GPS timestamp that's received, which should be every second, but sometimes they're missed, we use to resample the audio between it. Um, so obviously if we've lost audio, if we have some missing samples, we're just gonna be dilating the actual samples that we have, and that might be wonky, that might not work. Um, but we seem to have found that that issue has gone in the latest firmware that we're using. And also that if we're able to resample, you know, every second or as close to every second as we can, um, we also haven't been running into that problem, even where it did have some drop samples every so often. Cool, excellent. Okay, well, thanks so much, Lewis. Um, 
again, we or Louis, I'm sorry, Louis. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we've got a lot of um, great questions in the chat, especially about the the hardware and software that you're using. And so I'm hoping that we can talk about the accessibility and availability of these different tools. And so I've been thinking about a good transition. So from beaked birds in the forest, we now um, dive into the depths to explore beaked whales and how they um, achieve niche partitioning or the extent to which they do. So uh, welcome, Anna Maria. We're very excited to have you here with us and learn about your work. Thanks, Ben. That's a really good transition. Um, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Because it just so happens that my second slide is about beaks. So <laughs> there we go. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this intro here. I'm going to go right to that second slide about beaked whales and beaks. So there we go. They're known for having this unique, uniquely shaped um, rostrum or snout here, and that's why they are called beaked whales. And um, we're studying these because they are a data deficient family. So they're predominantly found offshore around seamounts and island chains. Um, they are deep divers, so they forage at meso and bathypelagic depths to um, collect prey. And they're hard to visually sight and classify. So here is an example of a day in the, the Western North Atlantic where it's considered to be a low sea state day um, and you're trying to find some beaked whales. And in this photo here, there are a total of three beaked whales. And in order to be able to classify them to species, you have to hope that one is showing its head. And in this case, it's this guy on the left. And um, looking at the different coloration and the shape of the beak, um, you can figure out what species of beaked whale it is. Um, but there's a lot of limitations here. So it comes to this question of how exactly are we going to study this family? So this is where passive acoustics comes in. So we can collect acoustic data in a myriad of ways. First, we can um, do so through um, bottom mounted recorders that provide great temporal resolution at a particular location. Um, these data are put out and then recovered at a later time. There are your mobile uh, instruments, which provide great spatial information. And there are also um, instruments um, that are attached to the target species that can provide us with high resolution behavioral information at short time scales. So from these instruments, um, we have learned that beaked whales as a family produce unique echolocation clicks that are distinguishable from dolphins and sperm whales by the presence of a frequency modulated upsweep shown here in this figure from Baum and Pickering et al. 2013. Additionally, these upsweeps are species specific, which means that each species can be identified based on the characteristics of these sweeps. So from the tag data, we have found that these beaked whale clicks are only emitted during foraging dives. So in this figure here from Tayek et al. 2006, you'll see the time of day on the x-axis and the depth at which these beaked whales are diving on the y, and the darker lines and circles are the clicks and buzzes of beaked whales that are um, performed at these deep depths below 400 meters or so. And then you have um, these shorter, shallower, silent dives um, that occur in between these deep foraging dives. So in terms of beaked whale ecology, they've, it's been focused primarily on two species of beaked whales in a few locations. So those being Blaine Bills and Cuvier's beaked whales. However, there are 24 species in this family. So is it fair to take the knowledge that is learned from these two species and apply it across the entire family? So this is where we're going to look into um, our, our ecology and um, you look at the concept of niche partitioning in which we'll use our bottom mounted recorders to examine the temporal partitioning of beaked whale species and our mobile recorders to understand the spatial and trophic partitioning of beaked whales. So this study was conducted in the Western North Atlantic in the offshore waters. And here we have six known beaked whale species. First, we have the polar and subpolar species, which are the northern bottlenose whales and sour bees beaked whales. Then there is true's beaked whales, which is a uh, warm temperate water species thought to occur um, just north of Cape Hatteras, shown here as this little star. Then there are the warm temperate and tropical species, which are Gervais and Blainville's beaked whales thought to occur south of Cape Hatteras. And then there's the cosmopolitan Cuvier's beaked whale. 
In this region, um, it is strongly defined by the presence of the Gulf Stream, which is a warm, salty water current that comes from the Gulf of Mexico, rides up along the shelf break of uh, the southeast U.S., and then comes the closest to shore at Cape Hatteras, which it then branches further offshore into the abyssal plain. And the significance of the Gulf Stream will um, be present, uh, prevalent later on in this talk with beaked whales. So in this area, we deployed 11 bottom-mounted instruments along the shelf break, shown here as these white squares, as well as there were two concurrent shipboard surveys that traversed the waters from the shelf break out into the abyssal plain, shown here as these black lines. And we truncated our data to an overlapping data time frame of July to August 2016. So for our temporal analysis, we looked at just the bottom mounted instruments and we ran a suite of detectors and classifiers through to detect beaked whale clicks and then uh, with manual review, um, identify clicks belonging to each of the beaked whale species. And um, if there were five or more clicks within a minute, we considered that species to be present for that day. Um, once we had all of our data, we then uh, used classification trees to look at the co-occurrence of beaked whales. And the results of that are shown here. So overall, beaked whales were present across our study area on 71% of the days during our time frame. And this figure on the right here is showing the daily presence with time on the x-axis and our recorders on the y-axis going from north to south. So just to draw your eye here, we have the most beaked whales present at our WC and BP sites, uh, the least amount of beaked whales at the OC site, and BC had the highest number of species present, a total of four species over the course of the deployment. From the classification tree, looking at the co-occurrence of these different species, we saw that sour bees uh, co-occurred with QVAs, mainly in the mid-Atlantic as well as the northernmost site. Trues and QVAs co-occurred in the mid-Atlantic. Gervais and Blainvilles co-occurred at the southern edge of our study area. And Gervais and QVAs were also um, mid-Atlantic-ish, round hit Cape Hatteras, plus or minus one site. The following species did not co-occur at any of our study sites. Now moving on to the toad array to look at the spatial analysis of our data. Um, this is looking at individuals. So what happens is that as the ship is going across these transect lines, the toad array is detecting and localizing beaked whales. And, is, and due to its inherent properties, we can go ahead and localize them to the individual. And so those are shown as these yellow circles here. Therefore, over the course of a cruise, you have more and more detections. And once you've collected all your data, you can then go ahead and extract environmental features of from those data points, and we extracted salinity, chlorophyll, SST, and bathymetry. These were then all put into another classification tree to look at species habitat preferences. So from this study site, uh, study area, we had a total of 394 beaked whale detections, um, and the results are shown here in this tree, and we'll walk through it together. It's a lot, but not a lot at the same time as you go through it. So the first divide here, you'll see there's kind of a difference in colors. The different colors are the different species of beaked whales. Um, and there seems to be a difference between the left and the right sides. And this corresponds to um, the Gulf Stream. So if you look at the different um, environmental uh, breakdowns, so we have chlorophylls and SSTs. And all of this um, translated really well to the properties of the Gulf Stream. So within the Gulf Stream, we had species um, Gervais and Blainville's beaked whales predominantly. Then moving on to the right side of our tree, this was more our northern half of our study area. We see that there's another divide at the bathymetry, where we have bathymetries less than or equal to 2010 meters, and then those that are greater than 2010 meters. And that might seem like an arbitrary number, but it actually aligned really well with um, where the slope area was in the northern part of the um, study area. So the slope was pretty li lined up pretty well between 200 and 2,000 meters. So those nodes that are on the left side of our tree um, pertained to the slope area versus um, the right side of the tree, which is more all of the detections that were in the abyssal part of the survey area. And here, um, you'll see that there's more of the pink on the left, that being sour bees, beaked whales, and then shrews were the dark blue here, and those being more in the abyssal aspect of our study area. 
Next, looking at the trophic analysis from the toad array, we can get from those individual localizations, we can calculate the whale's depth and therefore get a sense of its foraging location over the course of its dive. So here is one of the dive profiles from our data where you have the time during the dive on the X and the depth at which it was diving to on the Y. Uh, we go ahead and split the water column into 400 meter bins to allow for the localization and accuracies of our algorithm. And we went and estimated the 90th percentile of each of our um, dive profiles. We then went and compared where, where that, dive, that 90th percent bin was in relation to the bin that contained the seafloor. So here in this example on the left, we're seeing that the 90th percentile bin is different than the bin that had the seafloor. And so this whale was considered to be diving in the water column. Versus on the right here, we see that the 90th percentile and the seafloor bin are the same. And so therefore we said that that whale was diving in proximity to the seafloor. We then use the chi-square to understand if there were any interspecific differences in diving location, as well as a binomial GLM to see which species had significant differences. And from that chi-squared, we saw that there was indeed a significance in um, interspecific uh, diving location. And so then in the binomial GLM, we put in uh, Gervais, uh, Trues, and Cuviers as they had events that dove in proximity and uh, to the seafloor and uh, in the water column. The seafloor being the dark, the solid lines and the water column, the dotted lines. And from these three species, only Cuviers had a significant difference. Um, and I should note that Plainvilles and Sarbies only had detections that were considered to be in proximity to the seafloor. So to conclude, passive acoustics improves our understanding of beak bell ecology by broadening the number of species that we can study and examining the large spatial and temporal scales over which these species occur. And there's a nice, interesting interrelatedness of spatial, trophic, and temporal partitioning for this family. Um, from our data, we found that there was a maximum of four species at any site, but no more than two daily. And some thoughts about this is that species occupy different environments. So from our uh, toad array data, we saw that there was a difference of species being within or outside of the Gulf Stream, those inside being those of Gervais and Blainvilles versus um, sour bees and shrews. And then the difference between the abyssal and slope water species. So abyssal being more trues and slope being more sour bees. Then um, another thought is that these species can be targeting different prey. Um, so in general, cuviers are, have been uh, thought to, uh, have been seen to forage predominantly on cephalopods, whereas the uh, mesoplodons are foraging more on uh, bathypelagic fish. And we found in our study in our, that uh, cuviers significantly forage closer to the sea floor than the other species. And this could be um, due to things such as resource limitations or interspecific competition. And if it's the latter, I'm really hoping that they bring lightsabers. So that concludes my talk. And I'd like to thank my co-authors and those that helped analyze and collect the data in the field um, and our funders. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Ana Maria. It's interesting when, you know, so much in bioacoustics and I see niche partitioning, I immediate, immediately think of the acoustic niche hypothesis and what it means. But here in these deep ocean environments, just learning about their basic habitat use and behavior, that's the, the kind of niche partitioning that we can learn about through acoustics. Uh, does anybody have a question for Ana Maria? I'm for one curious about how much new knowledge this study has brought, you know, relative to the the boat based surveys, you know, has this really shed um, this array of recorders and, and your study has it brought a lot to light about how these beaked whales are using um, the the eastern coastline. I would think so. I'm I'm biased, but I would say that I think so. Um, so I know that prior to all this, we had no idea where trues were, and um, when out in the field, we had like after we were able to start visually identifying 
them, um, we were kind of like seeing like, oh, they kind of seem to be clustering around the 2000 meter bathy line. And, and it really, it's, it's just really nice to me to see that the, the acoustic data is showing that and then it's really highlighting that and highlighting that there's not just this latitudinal partitioning, but also this inshore, let's say inshore and offshore partitioning of beaked whales as well. So in my opinion, I would say so. Very cool. Hey, I hey, uh, just wanted to drop a question based on actually a question that is written uh, on the chat. First of all, thank you for this nice talk and amazing to know more about this very uh, difficult species to observe with visual cues. Uh, so what, what is the range of the, the bottom uh, mounted my, uh, microphones, but also the bolt based microphones, the range of detection of those? Yeah, they're pretty similar. So f these were harps that were deployed and Hildebrand estimated about three and a half kilometers for the bottom mounted harp data. And then the toad array data, we in general say that they um, propagate about four kilometers, but that was just pooling all the species together. And through a lot of the toad array work, I'm seeing that there are um, species specific differences in the detection ranges. So I would say anywhere between like 500 meters out to close to five kilometers. Yeah. Maybe we can have a bioacoustics talks about detection range because there's no one detection range for a given recorder. It varies based on the sound source and the environment, the background noise. Uh, so I think that would be an interesting session. Maybe we could do that in the spring. Um, we have time for one more question. Uh, so Tiago. Yeah, Hi, I, I, th I would thanks. like just to point out that uh, there's <laughs> like a function in the circuit learn math a Python package related with like the this the this like the special detection when do you can incorporate like two different uh, uh, sources of uh, attenuation for like trying to having like the different samples of, of combination of background noise with and a specific signal. And my question was like, uh, I don't know how much like boat traffic uh, it's like present in the area, but like, do you notice any kind of uh, like influence, like, like in the like in the niche part partitioning of the sound of those uh, marine mammals because of like I don't know what propofony. Yeah. So in in this area, it's. There's some boat traffic, not too much. It's mostly the offshore, the commercial fishing um, that happens out in this area. And beaked whales as a family are very uh, noise averse. They're very shy. Um, and actually for this data, um, the shipboard surveys uh, will operate in two modes, one with uh, active acoustics uh, working and then um, half the time and the other half the time with them off. And we've seen in previous work that uh, the usage of these active acoustics um, does influence the acoustic behavior of beak dwells where we have no detections when the echo sounders are on and we'll get a ton of detections when the echo sounders are off. So in this study, we excluded all of the times in which the active acoustics were operational and only used the data in which there was just um, the passive systems recording. Did I nice answer your question? question. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks again, Ana Maria. Uh, so last up, we'll move a little bit shallower than a thousand meters depth, but um, now we'll focus on the mesophotic reefs, um, I think in French Polynesia. And so we have Xavier who will join us and um, yeah, take it away. Okay, sorry, I forget to put the microphone on. Now and share again the screen. Do you see the presentation? Not yet. Now we do. Okay, thank you.
80 percent it could be the percentage of the hidden part of an iceberg but it's also a part of coral reef defined as mesophytic reef found below 40 meters depth coral reef occupy less than 0.1% of the oceans, but they inhabit more than 25% of all marine species. They are usually studied by scuba diving. However, there's a depth limitation caused by gases toxicity that limit us around 60 meters. The question that arises is how can we study mesophytic reefs? As reefs inhabit many vocal species like fish, benthic invertebrates, dolphins, and whales, a strategy could be to record their songs to assess their presence. The presence of whales is seasonally dependent, and like dolphins, they are highly mobile. Then they could not inform on the local condition of a reef. Invertebrates could be good quantities, but their songs are not species specific, making them complicated to use for monitoring. While fish songs appear to have the potential to be used in monitoring. To do so, we need to understand how acoustic fish biodiversity vary along the depth gradient and the diet cycle. And to do so, we joined an expedition named Under the Pool, made of extreme professional divers, diving using helium and rebreathers. Dives were made at 120 meters, 60 meters, and 20 meters. And at each depth, we asked them to place an acoustic recorder on the reef. This was realized in six different islands in French Polynesia. And in addition, the composition of the bottom was quantified. Polynesian reefs were acoustically very rich with more than 60 different fish songs. On the slide, you can see three tree maps, one for 20 meter depths at the top, one for 60 meters in the middle, and one for 120 meters at the bottom. We can see that one single sound type dominate mesophytic reef, so here in red, and that some sound types are more associated with 120 meters depth than shallower sites. It can be said that the occurrence of the different sound types was not equivalent for each depth. On this box plot, you can see the Shannon acoustic diversity, so it's an alpha diversity depending on the depth, so 20 meters in green, 60 meters in blue, and 120 meters in black. We can see a statistically supported decrease between 20 and 60 meters, but not below. It appears 60 meters is a transition zone between two distinct fish communities. Other analyses show that the highest similarities between acoustic communities were found between 60 and 120 meters depth. Finally, we use a canonical correspondent analysis. So it's an analysis very similar to PCT, okay? to link fish songs, type, islands, depths, and cover features, like, for example, the percentage of color. In this graph, you have CCA2 as a function of CCA1. So it's a little bit, again, like in a PCA. And you see both the sound types in red, the side, and 95% confidence in Talva ellipses. So in green, at 20 meters depth, in blue, at 60 meters depth, and in black, at 120 meters depth. Cover features like algae, coral, and dead coral appear on the left part of the field because these features are characteristics of the photic reef. On the other hand, other features like sponges, hydrogates, black corals, gorgonians, and sand 
are more typically found in the deep part of reef. This figure allows us to understand which zone is associated with each feature. Difference can reflect different habitat features. We clearly see that 60 meters depth is found between 20 meters depth and 120 meters depth. Concerning the dial cycle, this is what I am currently doing with my, two of my master's students. We clearly see a difference between daytime and nighttime. Furthermore, during nighttime, we can distinguish two different periods. Gamma models show the nocturnal or the onal character of each sound. The peak frequency of these different sounds is not equivalent. During nighttime, we see precise band of frequencies and we found similar results for deeper sites. The next step will be to perform niche analysis to understand in detail the repartition of these sounds. In French Polynesia, the deep part of the reef was dominated by a single fish that is highly similar to a sound described in the Mediterranean Sea, so in Europe, during the night, and produced by scorpion fish. These sounds had a higher variability here, probably produced by more species, contrary to what is observed in the Mediterranean Sea. Both acoustic fish diversity and community composition show a depth dependence. The transition zone coincides with a zone with a higher fish species richness on the drop off. In addition, another explanation of this division is the presence of one or more thermoclines, not to influence fish assemblage composition. Communities are also related to changes in the benthic cover composition. Concerning the diet cycle, both the absence of light because it's nighttime and because it's dead, increased acoustic complexity. To conclude, this study suggests that fish sounds reflect fish communities that depends on habitat characteristics and can be indicative of subtle differences in vertical gradients, buffer zones, and benthic cover. These results open new perspectives in the study and monitoring of the Haiti person hidden part of the iceberg. Before finishing, I would like to thank all my collaborators and the four sponsors that allowed me to realize this presentation in Portland in Oregon last month, namely the Belgian Royal Academy, the Wallonia Brussels Federation, the ESLA Ecology Section, and the Les Royal and Jean Brown Student Travel Award from ESLA. And thank you for the invitation to this Biacoustic Tours. And for your communication, feel free to ask them now or send me an email. Thank you. Thanks so much, Xavier. It's interesting seeing that there's a possible transition zone between the shallow reefs and then the 60 and 120 meter reefs. Um, do we have any questions? I was curious how you identified the different sound types that were present at the different sites. So to to identify the different sound types, we work with manual analysis. So we don't have any kind of this manual work. And we use the dichotomous key. So we class the sound families, like for example, frequency modulation, pulse series, and other families. And then we Yes, we use a decomptemous key, key with different questions. So, for example, looking the duration of the sound, the first period, and the main fre dominant frequency, presence of absence of harmonics, the criteria.
Does anybody else have a question for Xavier? I just kind of a follow up to that. Um, hi, that's super cool stuff. I love that we're getting into like fish sounds. Um, for like what you were talking about, I think one of the biggest things for like underwater is the lack of kind of reference sound libraries and um, reference calls, like you say, kind of having to go through a dichotomous key and figure out like to what kind of taxonomic level you can identify them. Um, are you like, is that call library, reference call library that you're you're using available anywhere um, for others to pull from? Uh, I'm sorry, but the, the Wi-Fi is not very good. If I understood, to ask about the reference library. Yes. So, like you were saying, the you've identified the call to certain taxonomic levels, um, and I was just wondering if that reference call library was uh, available um, to to and for others to use. So. You are right. So there's a really uh, a need of a reference library. So there's uh, something moving from, uh, especially from Canada. So they are building a fish sounds website. Uh, and for the moment, on this website, on this library, all the researchers are putting the sounds from species we know, so from identified species. And the next step will, will be to add sounds from unknown some, some, some types. So from other sources that we don't know the species, but for the moment it's still in progress, but it's moving slowly. Yes. I, I'm intimately familiar with uh, that process. So important, but very time intensive. Yes. Okay, well, this was a super fun meeting, our first one of the fall. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll be um, having one or more members from the Bird BirdNet team join us in two weeks to talk about a new GUI that can be used to retrain BirdNet to find signals of interest. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Louis, um, Ana Maria, Xavier. You started us off on a, a really strong note that will continue for the the whole semester. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, it's great to see everybody here again and looking forward to um, being together in two weeks. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Ben, for organizing this. For Thank sure. You. Yeah, good to see you all.